please, sir. That gets my goat. Okay, welcome back to That Gets My Goat. I'm Big Anklevich. I'm Rish Outfield. And this is a continuation of the talk of the continuation of Harry Potter. Yes, we're going to move on. It's Deathly Hallows Conversation Part 2. Yes. (laughs) But yeah, all the little things that they got to throw in there. Really good stuff. I don't know. It it just seemed like a really good, satisfying wrapping up of it all to me. And yeah, it wasn't a big surprise. There wasn't uh, anything that you didn't know about because most of us, I'm sure there are people that have gone and be like, what? We've spoiled everything for them by telling them that Fred dies. But But why would you listen to a podcast (laughs) about a movie that you hadn't seen yet? I don't know. Most of us have already had all those things told to us by the books, so uh, there's not a lot to be surprised by. But you wanted to see it, to see it happen and experience it that way. It's a a different way of going about it, and it was really cool. I wonder, I mean, shoot, how many years has it been since the last one came out? Three years, two years since the last book came out? Yeah, I think it was 2007. 2007, so it's been four years so, yeah, I mean, I don't know if uh, Rowling is just going to rest on her laurels and never write another book in her life. She obviously could. She's got billions of dollars in the bank. Gosh, I hope she doesn't do that. I mean, the pressure to write more Harry Potter-related stuff is going to be high, but just write whatever you want. Just Yeah, I'd like to see her create something else because she did such an amazing job with this. And yeah, take four or five years off, imagine it for a long time before you go forward with it or whatever, but it would be nice to see something else from her. I hope that she doesn't just disappear and stick with just that, although it's got to be hard. I mean, you were so unbelievably successful with this series that, you know, the possibility of putting something else out and having it fail has got to uh, scare the crap out of her because, you know, I mean, if she does another Harry Potter related thing, then... I'm sure she'll sell another gazillion books, but she's told the story, and I think that's probably the way she feels. She doesn't want to do other Harry Potter stuff. You can kind of tell just by the four years of silence, if nothing else. Yeah, it's got to be scary to put something else out and just hope that people will fall in love with it the way that they did with what you already did. She did put out that Tales of Beetle the Bard mm-hmm. book, which I think was one of those where the proceeds went to charity, which is pretty awesome. Mm -hmm. you're guaranteed to have people critical that it's not Harry Potter, Mm -hmm. no matter what you create. But as long as you're passionate about it and she's got the loads of talent that we've seen for the past few books, I would like to read it. I will give it a shot. Yeah, me too. And I even have tales of Beetle the Bard for that matter. There you go. Wow. Okay. So uh, we'll make the petition now, please. Joe, write us another book. And see, I don't know how that works. I mean, it's possible that you just become so tired after what she created for Harry Potter. But it's not like she was pumping one of those out every year. I mean, sure, the pressure was on to put out another Harry Potter. But, you know, she knew where it was going to go from the very beginning. And and so she wrote them. But does that empty your creative vessel so that you don't want to write anymore? You don't feel like you need to anymore? I, I, as a creative person, I couldn't do that. I, I would mm-hmm. I would imagine I would want to write for the rest of my life. Um, and maybe she has been, and she just doesn't share it with anybody. She mm-hmm. doesn't have to. She's got a circle of friends, and they swear that they'll never share what she's Whatever. written. Whatever. That else. stuff would be leaked so fast. It would be sold to the highest bidder. <laughs> it's possible, but I don't know. It's like the Beatles recorded a bunch of songs, and they just... Yeah, they didn't want to put them out in an album. They just let their friends hear them. Their friends are sitting there with these records in their collection. Just, no, oh, they said not to share them with the public, so we're not going to do it. You know that wouldn't last. It wouldn't last a week. Well, not today. <laughs> but back in those days, there were Beatles demos and stuff that didn't see the light of day for 30 years. And I don't know. <laughs> but yeah, there's a difference between a, something that you play for somebody else on a reel to reel and they don't have a copy and mm-hmm. to hear, read this story, right? You just don't share it with anybody else. Right. You know, it wouldn't happen. And you can say that JK Rowling is pretty much the Beatles of writing. Okay. Yeah. I, it's also hard to separate the eighth movie from the seven that came before it. 
And it has been really astounding to watch the same cast and these same kids grow up. Uh, I I read this article about how amazing uh, an accomplishment the Harry Potter series was and, you know, that it's been overshadowed by the Lord of the Rings because first couple years the Harry Potter movies were coming out. They were coming out at the same time as Lord of the Rings movies Mm -hmm. and those got all the Oscar nominations and all the kudos and that because these were seen as kids' films. But to start a movie franchise based on books that aren't finished yet... To just trust that the, the other books will be great and that these kids, eight, nine years from now, will still be willing to make these movies. And will develop into good actors instead of crap. And yeah, that they won't get revoltingly ugly. Although, I don't know about Rupert Grant. What do you think? Yeah, he's, he's I wouldn't say revoltingly ugly, but pushing it man but thank god emma watson stayed cute from the first movie right i I mean that seems kind of like a a little miracle too it's funny because Ginny always kind of bugged me and uh especially in that very very last scene when they gave her like the old they tried to make her look old and her hair was so bad (laughs) she was the one that uh, didn't age well unfortunately over those 19 (laughs) years it's terrible (laughs) Yeah. Uh, they gave Draco like this goatee. Yeah. <laughs> they did all sorts of goofy stuff. Harry had a little bit of stubble all over his face to try and make him look old. And 19 years later, they did not age very much in those 19 years. They didn't do a whole lot to try and make him look old. It was just, yeah, we'll give him bad haircuts and dress him in tweed jackets or something so that they'll look old. But um, I was really glad to see that scene was good stuff well hey it feels like we've uh run down on this already it's probably because it's so late but uh let me give, give my one bit of criticism although it sounds like i've made a lot of criticism <laughs> the one part that i didn't like was when harry mentioned to lupin his son obviously they shot a scene where lupin explained that he and, and tonks you know had a kid together there's that line in the seventh movie where she's about to announce her pregnancy and mad eye says you know there's no time for that horse shit uh, and they go on but if you cut the scene where lupin tells harry about his son or, or he meets harry's son cut the scene later that line. refers to it okay just 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 or the, the line yeah i'm sure we'll see it on the dvd but it's just weird that i don't know maybe it's maybe it was powerful line or necessary i mean it was sad Mm -hmm. that he said you know about his son but that just bothered me it was one of those things it's like uh, in fellowship of the ring the theatrical version they cut the part where dumbledore dumbledore where gandalf explains to frodo that Gollum was once called smeagol and he was once like a hobbit and then in two towers he says smeagol that's your name you know, you were once like a hobbit or whatever. And, and Gollum's like, how do you know my name? Well, they cut the line where <laughs> Gandalf told them how that was. I guess it doesn't matter. I mean, the special editions have been put back in, and so that's fine. Mm-hmm. But are there special editions of Harry Potter? I guess there are. Are there? Like longer versions. You, you well, just are there ha- longer versions or do you just watch the deleted scenes? I think that at least the first two movies have the TV cuts have been put on DVD now. You have to buy those three disc sets that don't have the crappy cardboard packaging (laughs) so they're actually doing you a favor making you buy them again right but i've never really been willing to go back and buy all those Mm -hmm. expanded box set versions or whatever because they're expensive and uh, my dvd collection was stolen a few years ago so i ended up buying them again anyway and you know we've had the dvd discussion how many times are you going to watch it does it merit me buying it a third time yeah are you gonna watch it thirty dollars worth yeah that's that's the question and and i don't think they're 30 either i think they're like 59.99 if you rent it you can rent it from uh, netflix Mm. for a certain amount of money or you can just own it will you watch it enough times (laughs) if you went to blockbuster and paid three dollars to rent it would you watch it as many times as renting it 15 or 20 or whatever times from blockbuster that's what I always use to try and figure it out. It's got to be something like you need to watch it once every two years or so at least to make it worth owning. I don't do that with anything. 
Yeah, but you have a buttload of kids. I mean, like a gigantic passel of kids. <laughs> I don't even know if that's a word, but it applies to how many, many, many kids you've got. Mm -hmm. And so they're also watching your DVDs. And kids tend to have the time to kids watch do. something again and again and again. They do watch them again. So kids' movies I don't worry as much about. I do own Tangled and I do own Princess and the Frog and all the Pixar movies and so on and so forth down the line. And they watch those several times. Human Centipede, The Grudge. Yeah, these are movies that the kids mm -hmm. will watch again and again. Kids love those. Cannibal Holocaust. These are all <laughs> uh, your, your, your youngest daughter. She sings the theme song to Cannibal Holocaust sometimes to me. It's, it's quite adorable. But the, the, the finish what I was saying before, it, it is a monumental achievement, these eight films. And that they've managed to, with the exception of the third film, keep a common feel to all the movies and a you know common look. And, and with the exception of one actor, they've all made it through all the films. And, and, and I just, that's pretty astounding. I mean, it's cost them a billion dollars, but, it's you know, they've made multiples of that. More. And so I think it's awesome that Warner Brothers believed so much in this franchise or, or in this, the, the books. And, uh, you know, I know part of it is that Rowling had this ironclad contract that said, you know, you can't do this and they all have to be British and you can know doing this. And, uh, you know, a lot of studios would be just like, oh, well then F you. Thank you. There's the door, Mr. Card, you know, that sort of thing. <laughs> But they believed in it and, you know, trusted and, and had faith that it would work out and that audiences would respond to it. And, oh, geez, they did. Just the crowd that we saw it with and how many of them were in costume. And, and my niece and I put little lightning bolt scars on our foreheads and more glasses. And that was as much as I was willing really to do <laughs> costume wise. But, oh, she was like, oh, we should have done this. And she took twigs off of the tree and made wands for us, you know, so that we'd have them. And, and yeah, it was, uh, I sort of regretted that we didn't go all out and I bought her costume and all that stuff, but it, it was a phenomenon and it was an experience. And hopefully she'll remember that forever. Of, uh, you know, oh, there'll never be a series like Harry Potter again. Yeah, and, and probably it, true. And my dad, oh, he pitched a fit that I took her to this movie and in the middle of the night and stuff. Cause but, she had school early in the morning. Right. School in July. <laughs> she, uh, but you know, he's, he's so old school and he and I couldn't be more unalike uh, to me. I felt like if she wanted to do it, it would be a memorable experience. It would be something that she would be able to talk about. Right. And, uh, yeah, I don't have kids of my own, but that's the sort of thing that you would look forward to doing with your kids. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, if, uh, <sighs> If they were re-releasing the real Star Wars trilogy in theaters <laughs> rather than the prequels, you know, it's like, oh, we're going to gather everybody together and we're all going to wear Jedi robes and we're all going to have lightsabers. And, and, and when Obi-Wan says, that's a name I've not heard for a long time, all of us are going to shout, how long? So he can say, a long time, second, you know, that kind of stuff. It just That's the sort of thing that you <laughs> long to take your kids to and, and, and bond with your kids over. Yeah, I, 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 hopefully she has this experience and she's able to appreciate it years down the line. And, and yeah, she was tired the next morning, but again, she didn't have to get up or do anything like that. And, yeah, and she slept late, took a nap or whatever. And she's fine. Yeah. It was really cool. And, uh, I, you know, part of me is sad that it's over. Right. I bet Warner brothers is so sad. <laughs> I mean, okay. It, it's clobbered these records and it's, it's now the number the biggest opening film of all time, $11 million more than dark Knight. Mm -hmm. So it's not like they just inched past dark Knight. You know, it's $11 million is what mall rats made its whole run. And mall rats was a big film. So until dark Knight rises <laughs> comes out next year, it's the number one opening film of all time. Right. Although, who knows, maybe maybe Twilight will give it a run for its money in November. I, I, I don't care. There was a Twilight trailer when I went to see yeah, it. Yeah, I lucked oh, out. And all the girls in the theater were all excited. Were they? Uh, that's, that's that's fine. I, I don't hate Twilight like I hate the Transformers films, but it's just it's not for me. Right. And at least I don't have people calling me an asshole for not liking Twilight like people do for not liking those awful Transformers movies. <laughs>
you know, as, as a, a full work of eight films, as a body of work, that's a time capsule for every one of those kids and all these different directors. And, and I don't know, maybe they could have structured it better had the books all been written first. Right. And they had known where they were going to go with each one. But, uh, you know, they made do with what they had, what, what they could. And, mm-hmm. and I don't know, some of those I haven't seen in a long time. Right. I watched three and seven right before we went and saw eight. And uh, wow, I was really surprised by how much I enjoyed three, mm-hmm. which is I had never really enjoyed that much. I was always so shocked by how different really? it was. I really liked number three when it came out. The source material is really great. On three. It is. Yeah. Yeah. And I imagine if I saw five, wait, which was the one I didn't like? Six. six. I imagine if I saw six again now, you know, I would appreciate it more. Yeah. I remember uh, in, in my own personal experience, uh, it felt like both with the books and with the movies, it was number three is when they really kind of took off. Yeah, that third first, book was great. The first two were pretty staid and almost run of the mill as far as, you know, kids' books kind of go. It was eh, pretty standard. And then when book three hit, you're like, wow, this is really good. And you were excited and jumped right into book four as fast as you could. And if I remember right, I think I was reading book three right as book four hit stores so i was able to get a copy of that and read it right away and then of course i wanted book five and i had to wait years for it or not years but year or more for it i don't remember exactly what the uh, release schedule was but um, it really did take off in the same way with the movies you know the first two were pretty similar pretty uh run-of-the-mill and you know christopher columbus it seemed kind of standard, and then, you know, they gave it to somebody else, and then it just kind of took off and really started going somewhere. And, and from it was almost like they didn't look back, although I have to admit, I, too, didn't like number six very well. It just seemed like it needed. There was a lot of things that weren't explained well enough, and it, it left a lot to confuse people. I guess most people that watch those movies also read the books. So they didn't have problems. But I, I know there's a fair number of people who are just like, no, I'm not going to read the books. I can see the movies. And so they would go to the movies. And I think they had to have been awful confused by the time that movie six was over. Well, that's the one that Steve Cloves didn't write. Oh, yeah? He wrote all of the others. Well, why didn't he write that one? Do you know? I don't know. He might have had another job or, or, or something like that. Or he was burnt out. Interesting. I, I don't really understand how that goes. But, you know, I'll follow his career. Uh, he's writing some amazing Spider Man or something that's coming out Crap next year. Like that. Some Maybe kitty I'll, movie. I wouldn't otherwise go see it. But right. since he's the screenwriter, I think I'll check it out. Cool. That's cool that you'll keep following uh, the stuff that he does. But uh, that's another thing that's amazing about these films is because they were so successful. Now other people, other studios will probably make leaps of faith and say, hey, we're going to try and adapt, you know, f- uh, this four book series or we're going to do all this kind of thing. You know, all it takes is one superhero movie making a ton of money and, you know, other superhero movies get made or first TV sitcom without a laugh track and it's successful. And others say, hey, we don't need that crutch either. I, I know we talked about this years ago just how many kids took to reading because of Harry Potter. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, maybe this entire generation of kids that loved books because of Rowling's work will write their own kind of thing or will make the movies of the next 20 years and they will be influenced by what happened here. And, you know, they'll all be able to go back and say it was because of that. The same way that our generation, you know, said because of Star Wars, because of what Lucas and Spielberg made, we make what we did and, and we're mm-hmm. going to try this and, and all that. I, I look forward to I like the Hunger Games being made, you know, as one of those where they're, they're not just going to make the Hunger Games. They're going to make all three of those darn books and right. they're pumping buttloads of money into it. And, and uh, hopefully we'll be faithful to the books because the Harry Potter movies were faithful to the books and, and, and it paid off. Yeah. Every once in a while you'll see a movie that's ostensibly based on a book. 
Right. <laughs> you pick up the book and it doesn't even have the same title. <laughs> <laughs> I, I felt that way, you know, not that I was a huge fan of this book, but I read it with my kids, the Lightning Thief book. The Percy Jackson one. Right. And they really enjoyed that book. And I, I know that my wife went on and read all the, the books in that series. And my uh, other kids have read uh, several of them. And they were all excited when the movie was coming out. And we went and watched it. And it was one of those where they didn't believe in it. They weren't very faithful to it. They expected that they were it was going to be a one-off thing. They weren't going to get to do the uh, rest of the series. And they made sure to tie it up. They didn't put any of that stuff that leads you on to the next one and to the next one. Too bad. See, well, I was dismayed when I read that to see that he was supposed to be like 11 or 12. <laughs> and in the movie, you know. He's 16, 17, yeah, 18. One of those things. Just because, oh, well, I, I mean, I understand that. I understand the crutch. And I mentioned probably in the last episode that Orson Scott Card's problems with Ender's Game is Ender is supposed to be a little kid. And the studios all say, no, 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 he has to be a teenager. And he has to have a love interest. And he's like, no, 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 he's a little kid. He's a child. And the story doesn't work if, if he's not. Unless he's an innocent. And they're like, oh, pfft, well, then we're not making that. And he's stuck to his guns. And I don't know how wealthy a guy Orson Scott Card is. But <laughs> he's certainly not the kind of man that he would be if Hollywood yeah. had made these movies. He's much less wealthy than he could be had he managed to sell the rights for big money to somebody. But he stuck to his guns and he's only going to let them make his story into a movie if it is his story and not something else. And I don't know if I could do that myself. I guess maybe uh, the second or third time around you might think that. But, uh, man, if Hollywood came calling after I'd written a book and wanted to give me money for the story, but they wanted to change it a little bit or do whatever they wanted to do with it, I don't know if I could turn down the money. <laughs> I'd probably have to just say, oh, okay, yeah, maybe I'll write another book later that I can stick to my guns on. <laughs> yeah, that's a question that I don't know if you can answer it until that's at your door. Right. That option is in your hand. You know, just would you sell out? Oh, <laughs> hey, that time I made the that tired That was a time. grunt, yeah. We, I guess we got to uh, break this up again. We, we can't have part three, though, can we? They didn't do that many parts in the movie. Okay, but... No, wait, there was eight movies. So, we, we can, so we're going to break this up into eight pieces, folks. Just like Voldemort did to his Ooh. soul. No, we're not going to go that long, but we are going to cut it off here and come back again next time. All right, well, thank you, folks. Good night. Yeah, see you later, folks. That Gets My Goat is produced under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. Here's a question for you. Stephanie Meyer and her whole series. When she sold the rights to those, did she say, I don't know if you know how it went. You, you are always pretty knowledgeable. If not, I guess you can cut this part out of the thing. But she sold the Twilight, at least, to Summit, when they were not a big deal, they were nobody. So they obviously couldn't have paid her a lot of money for the rights to Twilight. After she sold the rights and they started working on the, those books really took off and became the phenomenon that they were. And then when the movie came out, they, they made an astounding amount of money off of this because they spent next to nothing on the first film. And then, yeah, from then on, they were spending big money and making even bigger money on each uh, subsequent film. Do you think Stephanie Meyer made uh, her fair share off of the sale of those uh, films? Did she? Do you know if she sold all the rights to all the series as a package deal at the start? Or was she able to sell each further film uh, separately and get the money that they were worth? Well, see, I think she sold the rights to Twilight before that book had even come out. Oh, really? Somebody had read the galleys, you know, read the advanced copy and they said, you know, we'll give you $600,000 right. for the rights or something. And that's just a silly number. I don't know what it was. But it was small. Yeah, it had to and be small. And of course she jumped on it uh -huh. because this was a book and who knew whether it would sell. Right. And, you know, it might have been $60,000, but you'd still say yes. Right. And then, yeah, Summit gathered the money together to make this movie. And it was a low-budget movie, but still... You and I trying to gather, let's say it cost $18 million to make Twilight. We couldn't gather $18 million if it took 10 years. Mm -hmm. And so 
I, I think by the time that movie came out, she had had a couple of these books had come out and they had become a phenomenon. Right. And so probably the deal for the second book, Eclipse or whatever, to make that into a movie, she got big money for that. Because, yeah, Summit makes lots of movies and big movies these days. But it's all because of that. And it's all because of that. They were nothing before that one film, which just, yeah, it kind of blows me away. And I, I, not that I care one way or another, really. It is interesting, though. But I, I hope that Stephanie Meyer got her fair share out of the deal just because she came up with the story she's the author and i I take the author's uh, side in most things because i would like to be one myself someday well you know she made a mint selling what's the non-twilight book she wrote the host the host right and some studio wants to make that into a movie oh yeah i wonder how that'll work out but it's one of those it's gonna have to be like dune because basically, my wife made me read that book, and it's it's about an alien that like takes over your mind, and she has argues with it, like this alien in her mind and stuff. And we're like, Dune, it's just gonna be all whispering. She's using the voice. <laughs> the alien just whispers to her in her head the whole time. I don't know what it'll be like, but well, do you think honestly that you will find out? You will go see a host movie. Uh, I don't know. I've wound up seeing several of the Twilight movies because my wife wants to see them. Huh. So It's weird that that doesn't work the other way. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It's sometimes I wonder why my wife would take me to some films because a lot of times it's just like, oh, you're ruining it. Stop complaining about this movie. 